Well, I started, I actually started as a sculpture and went to the Royal Academy as a sculpture. But uh, then my father became the professor. <laughs> so I thought I'd better change. So I changed to architecture. And then I, I was at the Royal Academy as an architect for five years and uh, finished as an architect. And then I continued as a landscape architect for another three years. So basically that was a quite long uh, study. In between that, I also used a year on, on working on, on furniture design and did a lot of survey in, in, in Paris about measuring uh, houses by Le Corbusier and others. And so it's, it's a quite broad uh, study, not so precise, but I knew what I wanted. Uh, but, but besides that, I, I, there were no jobs when I ended up. So, so it was a time where things were not easy to get a job. And I got a job at uh, a design magazine where I was a researcher uh, uh, doing an, an international magazine. So we were doing things all over the world. And, and my luck was that I knew most of the, the designers I had to talk with. So it was, in that sense, easy. And then after a few years, uh, I continued and started having projects. And then I came on the team for Le Grand d'Arche in Paris with Svenning Andersen, who is quite famous in this building, and, uh, and worked for Svenning for six years. And um, parallel with that, I started my own office. Well, uh, I grew up in a very big garden and, in a park. And uh, until I was 13, we had a gardener. So I was walking behind him all the time. We did all kind of of vegetables and had uh, 14 different kinds of, of apples and a real gardener. And uh, in the park we were doing all these things about having lawns and having uh, low grass and high grass and and maximizing the, the amount of, of birds, for example, trying to keep open and close so that we would have a, an absolute maximum of birds and putting up uh, artificial nest and whatever you can do to, to, to do that. And uh, of course, Growing up like that, and, and, and from our thirteen, I had to, it was my garden and my job to take care of it because I wouldn't get any pocket money from my parents if I didn't. I hated it. But over the years, of course, it gave me a, an enormous knowledge of trees and how they grow and how you do. So, so I would say that at, at that time, I was already a skilled gardener. That's one thing we haven't talked about uh, in this seminar, which I think is interesting. That's the ability for grass to give light. If you have a, a, a piece of gravel, which you often have in a big square, it, it doesn't give very much light from it yourself. But, but when you have grass, it, it, it really captures the light. So, so it capture, it makes a flow of light, which uh, also grass is so different whether it's in the shadow or whether it's in the sun. So, so in that way, this way of working with, with grass can be a very precise tool, which you can actually easily use. Uh, we, no one today uh, came into to that discussion, but I think it's far more interesting than how you cut the grass. Well, I think that in a, in a society where more and more places in the world people are grown up in cities, it's essential that many of these things, we, you could see that uh, on the discussion we had today, uh, we're discussing which machine you use when you're cutting grass. But uh, I don't know the English word, but, but basically I will use uh, an old-fashioned one which is fantastic and, and very fast even. And if, when you use such one, what's the, what's the English name? What's the Italian name? for? for? Uh, yeah. Ah, falce. Ah, yeah. Ah, falce. Yeah, but you have the one which is a little bigger, which you use for uh, corner. Falce. But, but, but anyway, when you use yeah, that one, you can, you, can, you can twist it around flowers. So, so it's a fantastic way of keeping... Uh, two-year flowers, if you want that, so you can go around them, and then it would be fantastic the year after. So, so many of these things, if you come to your machine, it, it just cuts everything, and it even cuts small, small pieces of soil, so it becomes more and more smooth. And that's not how you see a, a, a lawn. I remember one time a gardener had redone a, a house I had, and, and he had made everything completely flat. And, and after a month, we decided to take that away and put it back to these small things, because that was how you saw the distance. And I think things like that are essential. It's all about light. You don't see a garden very much when it's just dark. I've been working in this uh, 
field for more than 30 years, maybe more, maybe 40, maybe more. And uh, it, it's all about uh, remembering how things go if you do the one or the other thing. It's how remembering that uh, that grass always start to come in a in a in a place with cobblestones in the shadow. It doesn't come in the sun. So so there are all these things which you accumulate, and and I think uh, being a landscape architect is so much about accumulating. That's why I believe that old landscape architects are so good to talk to because they have an enormous knowledge about things how things works. But again, if 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 everyone lives in a city, you need to give this experience of, uh, of a country life to, to, to know how do you do it? How do you put the things down? How do you spread your seeds? How do you make good grass? How do you fertilize it? 